Tutin Orbeline would like to welcome you to the introduction to the nature of reality. I'm not quite sure why it's called that, but we've been going through the Heart Sutra. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Eddie Pete, for walking us through this. I appreciate it. Um, I've been learning quite a bit, so thank you. Thank you, Shayla. Okay, so am I on screen and appearing to everybody okay? Everything's all right? Excellent, thank you very much. Well, welcome to class, everybody. And as Shayla has said, this is about introducing us to the nature of reality by way of the Heart Sutra. Uh, so to begin to understand this, we need to sort of set a, a, good minute, a good motivation for doing so and to prepare the body and mind to hear this message and to uh, understand it and then do the best we can to put it into action. So we'll begin that part, we'll begin that preparation by getting comfortable in our seat, adjusting the posture till you feel quite relaxed and at ease. And you can allow your eyes to close or keep them open. And whether your eyes are closed or open, I would like you to now become aware of the movements that are taking place within your body as you inhale and exhale air. So breathing normally and naturally. We're focused on the movements that take place in the body as we inhale and exhale. And by doing this, we are allowing the body and the mind to relax and for the mind to be focused. And with the mind focused and the body relaxed, it's very easy to imagine that we are already in the company of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. In fact, they're present in the room with us. The vast array of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, deities, Dharma protectors. And here is Solitaire realizes and the Arahats are in the space above us and in front of us. While all sentient beings are seated surrounding us. We recollect that everyone has an equal wish to avoid suffering and equally everyone wishes to be happy. And equally we all lack genuine happiness. Nevertheless, whatever causes and conditions hinder or prevent genuine happiness, these can all be overcome so that our suffering can be eliminated and the potential for genuine happiness arise and flourish. Now, 
that to dispel the causes of suffering and actualize genuine happiness, we need to rely upon others who have done that. And these are the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, the Arahats and so forth. So we're going to take refuge um, in these masters and in the Dharma that they taught and in them as a spiritual community. So please join me in taking refuge and generating a mind of enlightenment. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. from the heart of the Buddha, um, lights and nectars pour forth and wash over your body. They remove every hindrance to being an authentic refugee who relies upon the teachings of the Buddha. So I think that you're um, fully empowered to understand these teachings and to put them into practice. You now think of all the beings uh, surrounding you and wish that they too could be free from suffering and its causes, that they would have happiness in its causes, that they'd never be separated from the higher forms of happiness and they could all abide in equanimity, being free of the bias it comes from attachment and aversion and indifference. Now, in response to this wish of yours, again, rays of light and nectar leave the heart of the Buddha and they wash over you again and everyone else surrounding you. And you find that whatever has hindered these four immeasurable thoughts is vanished. And you find yourself established in these four immeasurable thoughts of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Now you see yourself and all beings who surround you I'm prostrating before this vast refuge field, making offerings, confessing, and generally just engaging in the seven limb prayer, which you can now uh, recite. So reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since the beginning of this time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of psychic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own and others' merits to the great enlightenment. And now just in case we have any vestiges of clinging to our merit, we can transform all of it, our body, speech and mind into a wonderful pure land through the wisdom realizing emptiness. So this all arises as a mandala, which we are now to give away, to offer to the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas and so forth. So reciting along with me, this ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam gururata mandala kamayatayami. So the Buddha accepts the mandala, and he looks down at us and smiles with delight. And we look up into his eyes 
and we feel accepted and at ease. And then an emanation of the Buddha leaves his heart, moves through space, and comes to rest above the crown of your head. The emanation now begins to descend, entering the crown of your head and coming down through your body to rest at the level of your heart. And now the radiance of this emanation begins to expand, filling your body and mind with light. And the light goes out through the pores of your skin and begins to fill the 10 directions of space. And wherever beings exist through their dependence upon space, think that they're touched by this light and they are transformed into the fully awakened state of Buddhahood. And you experience a great feeling of joy and there's an acknowledgement that there's no difference between yourself and any other living being. And now the light begins to retreat from the 10 directions of space. Comes back and re-enters your heart. And you're aware of the movements taking place within the body as you breathe normally and naturally. You are embodied and have the understanding that this meditation was done on the level of imagination and has imprinted the mind with its potential to fully awaken for the benefit of others, thereby accomplishing your own welfare and the welfare of others. And so again, allow a sense of joy to arise, have a smile come across your face, and in your own time, breathe in a little more forcefully um, through the nostrils. Then exhale through the mouth and allow your eyes to flutter open and move your body in whichever direction you like so that you find yourself very comfortable in your seat and at ease. Okie dokie. Well, welcome along again to class. Let's have a look at what we're going today to do today. So we're going to do two things. We're going to discern or mean acknowledge the wisdom of the emptiness of inherent existence, which takes place on the path of seeing. And then we're going to move along to the objects of this wisdom that are found on the path of meditation. The two, two major things, and boy, doesn't it take up quite a lot of the text. So let's have a, um, a look at some of the books I've relied upon and before we look at the outline. So here, the books haven't changed. A um, bit more, to re more reliance on searching for the South because it has such a great um, explanation of the object to be negated, inherently existent persons and phenomena. Now, this is a new outline, um, and I've brought it up to introduce to you the idea that outlines of particular texts aren't always the same. 
And we at Langley Tungpa Centre had a teaching given by a Geshe, uh, Geshe Sopa, Geshe Zopa, um, a number of years ago, and this was the outline there. So you know the other one, it only had four major points, didn't it? You know, and then, then we could break it up. Here we've got 10. And I wanted to put the 10 in because now we're really coming to this part here, the parts I've highlighted, three and four. Defining the wisdom, being the wisdom realized in emptiness of inherent existence, and the different objects that we're sort of focused on here. And like I said, this is on the path of, of meditation. <clears throat> and so we're continuing our extensive explanation, which was given for those of um, ordinary intelligence. Right? It says here they describe as people with inferior faculties. And here, as you can see, we're going through these different five paths. So the previous uh, three weeks have led us up to the path of preparation. Uh, and we're going to, like I said, today have a look at the path of seeing and the path of meditation. And path of no more learning will come up uh, after them. So some of you might not be familiar with these terms. So I'll just, just briefly give you an overview. Uh, so we have um, three Buddhist vehicles. So a vehicle takes you from one place like, to another. Yeah. So we have the vehicles of the hearers. So, so these people sort of, like, listen to the teachings of the Buddha, put them into practice and achieve their goal or do the best they can to achieve their goal, which is their own personal liberation. So that's um, one vehicle, the vehicle of the hearers. Miffy. Eddie, Eddie, don't forget to just stop this, ah, this, the yep. screen for a second. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got the vehicle of the hearers. Then we have the vehicle of the solitary realizers. Uh, so these, these people don't do not depend upon a, a Buddha for the, in their final lifetime to achieve their goal. So and their goal is personal liberation. So we have hearers, solitary realizers, and these are two vehicles, both aimed at personal liberation from the cycle of uncontrolled rebirth. Then we have the vehicle of the bodhisattvas. So, these people wish to achieve uh, enlightenment for the benefit of all. Now, you would have seen or you would have noticed that there are those five paths. Each of those vehicles has those five paths, meaning the names are all the same. There was the path of accumulation, path of preparation, path of seeing, path of meditation, and path of no more learning for hearers, solitary realizers and bodhisattvas. Now, what, what they do is slightly different on each path, but they have some commonalities about them. So to enter um, the paths of the hearers and the solitary realizers, you need to have renunciation. a determination to become free from cyclic existence. To enter the vehicle of the bodhisattvas, you need to have an uncontrived bodhicitta, mind of enlightenment. And that is based on the renunciation. You cannot have the mind of enlightenment without renunciation. Now, in those five paths, um, two of the paths are called ordinary paths, and the other three paths are called superior paths or aria paths. So that should give us some sort of clue when we say aria paths. Yeah. So the path of accumulation and path of preparation are for people just like ourselves who are studying this material. We have a, a getting, we've got a pretty good intellectual understanding of it, but we want to make it like real. Or we want to really experience the result of our, our of our learning. So we want to actually know 
what would emptiness be like if I actually experienced it? If it was more than just the, uh, a good, a correct and good idea? Because it's said, you can actually see it. You can know it. And so that's when the path of seeing begins. So before it, we're ordinary, path of accumulation, path of preparation. From the path of seeing onwards, we're extraordinary. Our understandings have deepened uh, so that they are of a direct type. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this presentation here is given for those of, like I said, inferior uh, faculties. So we've been learning about this material, just as we have been for the last um, three weeks. And we've been sort of focused between the path of accumulation and preparation. So I'll just give you a very quick review now of what we said last week. So um, what we're trying to do is to see the falsity of what appears to us, which is inherent existence. We want to see that it's false and we don't want to, we want to stop believing in that falsity. We want to stop buying into the project. Okay. So we need to ask ourselves some, some questions. And one way of asking these questions, we can say to ourselves, look, if inherent existence did exist as it seems to, there's only a few ways it could exist. It could be inherently one the same thing with, with something else or inherently different. And that's it. There are no other choices there. It's the same or different in terms of their inherent existence. So it's not ordinarily the same, and it's not ordinarily different. We're talking about inherently the same, inherently different, truly the same, truly different. So those terms, um, it's like this, right? So they're inherently one or they're inherently many, inherently the same or inherently different. And if they're not either one of these two, then they're not inherently existent at all. Because things can only exist to be the same as something or different from something. And if they're not different and the same or the same, then they don't exist, right? So if you're unsure of this, just think about it. <laughs> it goes in there. So if I have two things, are they the same or different? <laughs> and you go, well, obviously the same or they're different. Is it, well, is there any can, other way? Now, can you just you know, give us some an example of just a really simple example, like I don't know, to, with a book or a body or something, just to yeah, sure. Uh, um, in yeah. the words. Uh, well, I think what I want to do is actually demonstrate it, so you can actually learn oh. it. You can okay. discover it, right? because <laughs> one very simple thing when we say, um, when you look at anything being inherently the same, right, or inherently singular, now you take, just take, what well, I say, anything, any, any, any one thing, and go and ask yourself, does that one thing have parts? And you're going to say, yeah. So it can't be inherently one. It's already inherently many. <laughs> if it were anything, it would be inherently many. It's definitely not inherently one, right? because it's made of parts. Right? So you can, refute, you can knock that one out. Right? But then you, you look at all the manys. They're all it's a many, many ones, aren't they? Many parts. And each part is a singular part made up of many parts. So if you're not inherently one, you're not going to be inherently many. It's impossible. <laughs> because many is just a group of ones. So, Eddie, this is, I mean, it's quite amusing in a way because when I try and figure things out, this is exactly the thing that I come up against. But I'm still trying to find what is it, what one thing is it, whereas actually the answer is you can't pin it down. It's not inherently real at all. <laughs> no, that's right. It's not, and this is so logically, as I just said, you can sort of go, you know, <laughs> shake yourself a bit and go, oh my God, that's right. And then of course, within the text, they, they give you lots of examples. I think on inherently one, there's like um, 10 different examples they, they give to you. So, well, if you thought you were, 
these are the weird things that had happened. Uh, and, and you know that this is not the case. Right? Like, for instance, you would be your body. If you're inherently one and the same with the aggregates and form, which is your body, you are the same as the body. You could go, okay, so when I am something physical, because right? the body is physical, you can take all the parts that are physical and go, well, somewhere in here is me, which is physical, because all these other parts are physical. And, and of course, that you don't find yourself there. Another thing, of course, would happen is that you could not have um, many lives, past lives, all that sort of thing, because the body dies in this life, it finishes in this life. It, you know, we have this phenomenon called death, we're dead. So not only would be able to, not only would we as a person or the eye be visible to visual consciousness, um, future lives would not exist. Um, the Buddha could never have even spoken of them. All, all, all sorts of weird things happen. Yeah. But like I said, if you just do the analysis of being one and the same, inherently one and the same, then you go, well, hang on a minute, one thing has parts. Right? So it's not going to be inherently one. <clears throat> So what I'd like to do now is to, as I said, you know, we talked about this as reasoning and so forth. You can find plenty of reasons in the, in the books. Um, what you'll find is that it doesn't, the import of it doesn't go very deep. So it's just like sort of interesting thing to know, really. Uh, unless you sort of um, bring it into your life and sort of looking back into your past and what you might be thinking of the future and so forth. So I've got a meditation for us to discover um, experientially whether we were inherently one or inherently the same. And I'd like to do that with you now. It won't take very long. So I'll, I'll open up the slide and I'll, here's the question. Do we truly exist? So what, what this question is asking is, we're asking ourselves, right? do I exist, because this is the thing about the truly exist, right? do I exist in the very same way as I appear to myself and others? To be truly the same or truly different from my aggregates? That's what we're sort of asking. Because this, this word truly existent is, is, you know, it's a phrase, but it, it means sort of thing that something to be true exists in the way that it, it appears. Then I can say it's true. If it's not existing in the way it appears, it's false. There's a discrepancy there. So we're asking ourselves, like, you know, I, I seem to be the body, I seem to be the mind. Um, so that's, there we have true existence, one and the same. So now um, it's a it's it's important to try and like recollect river um, inherently the same inherently different. It's the same here. Do I inherently exist? Do I truly exist? Now, um, so so when we go through these questions, you've got to don't let go of the idea of inherent existence here or truly true existence, right? Because that's that's what we're trying to work out. Do I truly exist? or not? Do I inherently exist or not? It's not just do I exist or not, it's do I inherently exist or not? Do I truly exist or not? Because obviously we exist. Right? We're, we're sitting here looking at one another, talking to one another, we exist. Uh, that's, that's not the thing, it's how we exist. How we exist. So <clears throat> I think you're probably all on a seat. They're probably all sitting on a chair somewhere. So I want you to just ask yourself, who is on your seat? Who's on your seat? And I hope you can also say, I am. <laughs> I am on my seat. Now, are the aggregates of the body and mind also on that seat? Or if you say just the general aggregates of the body, is that also on the seat that you're sitting on? You have to say, well, yes, it is. It's, of course it is. The aggregates are on the seat. Now, are you 
truly the same as the aggregates? Are you truly the same as the aggregates? And here you're going to say no. But the question is, but why? Why are you not the same as the aggregates? Why are you not truly the same? And the answer is because you are imputed to the aggregates. Because if you ask like, what is a person? The person is the I imputed to any of the four or five aggregates. So you are the person sitting in your seat. You are defined as an I imputed to the four or five aggregates. So you can't be the same as you're imputed to them. You are not intrinsically the same. You are not truly the same. Why? Because I am imputed to the aggregates. So now I would like you to imagine, or if you want to, just roll your body off the seat. I think your body's rolling across the floor, going away from the seat. Now I want you to look back and ask yourself, who is on the seat? Who is on the seat? Okay, so now, now just if, you, you know, if your eyes are closed, you're going to see what's on the seat. Now, so if your eyes are closed, please um, allow them to open now. And I want you to tell me who was on the seat. Well, it's nobody, like literally nobody. Okay, that's right. There's nobody on the seat. Bob, any, you want to say the same? Nobody? <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Okay. Well, is, why is there no body on the seat? Be because it left the seat. It That's rolled right. across the floor. That's right. Anybody else have anything to suggest about who was on the seat? Uh, Jeanette says no body as well. Yep. yep. Anybody else saying anything other than no body? How about not me? Yeah, the absence of you is on the seat. That's right. There's <laughs> an absence of me on the seat. It's oh, not me, Alicia, right? person of superior faculties. I've yeah. been listening to lots of Venerable Rabina last week. <laughs> yeah. So we started with I am on the seat and my body is on the seat. And I rolled my body off the seat and I am not on the seat. We've also, we've also worked out and we've already said, yeah, I don't, I am not one and the same as my body. No, that's what we said. We asked, are the aggregates all the same? Yep. Are you truly the same as the aggregates? We've said no. No. Why not? We've got a good reason. It's true. It's the right reason. We're not the same. So when we roll the body off the seat, the I that if it existed truly, should be on the seat. Uh, but it's not. So we can see we are not inherently different. We are not truly different. So if we're not truly the same and we're not truly different, we don't truly exist. Finding ourselves not there means we are empty of inherent existence. We don't have any inherent existence because if we did, we'd be there. And we've taken out the two extremes, not inherently the same because we're imputed, not inherently different because we're not there, we're empty.
Um, Eddie, Susan's got a question. Yep, Susan, yep. You lost me. You lost me. Okay, it's okay. We all get lost here. <laughs> this is a tricky one. So I've got to start looking back at the seat, somebody else might have sat down there. But anyway, I was following you up to that point. And then, yeah, I know I'm, I, I'm not on the seat. If I'm not, if I'm not on the seat, I'm not on the seat. Yeah, so... Beyond that, I'm not, uh, I'm not so aware. if you're not on the seat, you are not intrinsically existent. You do not truly exist. Why? Because if you did, you would be on the seat. Why would I be on the seat? I got because off. Because we're seat. trying to see if you are inherently the same as your body and mind, or inherently different. You know, we know you discern here. You are not inherently the same because you're imputed. Right? So you're not inherently the same. You've wiped out one side, we know now, I'm not inherently the same as the body. I'm not inherently the same as the mind. Can you get to that part, Susan? No. Okay, so there we have to find it, like I said, so then we need to go back to the other slide and, and slowly go down and go, if anything does exist, it's either same or different, one singular or plural. That's just if it normally exists, conventionally exists. You know, say, well, if it inherently exists, I can use the same idea. It either inherently exists the same or inherently different. That covers everything. The same and different covers everything. But Eddie, if I existed on the seat conventionally, why can't I exist on the floor conventionally? If you existed conventionally on the seat and you existed conventionally on the floor at the same time. No, not at the same time. After I got off the seat, I existed on the floor. Yep, then I, you can go back um, up and you can go back and sit up on the chair, right? But yeah, whether but you're sitting on the chair the or on the floor. What this will show you is that you don't exist inherently. You don't truly exist. So, it, Susan, also you're saying conventionally. So conventionally you can exist either on the seat or the floor, no problem. But this is looking for the really, who am I really? And this yes. is that's a really different thing. So yeah. we're trying to separate out, kind yeah. of pull all, yeah, all the different parameters out to see what's left. What we're trying to separate two Susan, is the idea that something that conventionally exists does so inherently. Because those are the phenomena we're seeing to have inherent existence. All the conventional phenomena, all the phenomena that actually conventionally exist, seem to have an existence from its own side when, it, when they don't. Yeah, I, I get that. They don't have an existence from their own side. We don't exist the way we perceive ourselves to or others perceive. That is, I get that. But this thing about being on the seat or off it. I... Okay, well, obviously, this thing doesn't take, um, it's not that you hear this or <coughs> think about it once and you get it. That's not the case. So it, it does require a lot of thinking about it and, and working out what you're trying to negate. Because it's not, we're not trying to negate conventional existence, conventional, conventionally, because here we are, like I said, we're all talking. We obviously exist. <laughs> and we're all in our seats listening. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we really exist. That's that's done. <laughs> it's not it's not about that. It's like how do these things that do exist actually exist? So actually what we're trying to do here is um, tease apart the, the conventional right. and the truly. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So if you ask, so when we come up to hear about like truly exist, right? So I said, so what does it mean to truly exist? It means that your appearance and the way of existing are in harmony. Are one and the same. 
So if, if you get that part, you say, okay, if that's the case, if that's what I'm agreeing to, that means that when someone looks at my body, they see me. Me and the body are one and the same. Yeah? Inherently, one and the same. And this is saying, no, 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 that's wrong. You're wrong. They're one and the same conventionally, but they're not inherently. We're talking about the same thing. You know, we find any part of the body, we, we say, oh, or hear the voice. Oh, that's Eddie's, that's Eddie's hand. That's Eddie's voice. All these sort of things, right? They're not one and the same. I understand that. What I don't get is the chair thing. I, don't, I can't approach it from the chair visual, visualization. So what, what appears to your mind when you look at the chair? Nothing. If I'm not there, zero. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, there's a, so normally what we say is nothing, right? But this is the mistake, right? Everybody goes like nothing. We're not coming to nothingness. Nothing's an extreme. So what's not there? Well, what is there? What is there? If nobody's sitting on it, what's there? What's right there, a couple of things. If you just look at what's on the chair, you just say, well, there's nothing on the chair. It's just space on the chair. Yeah? But we're not looking for that. We're looking to see who is on the chair. Uh, so we're qualifying it by saying, um, not yeah. me. Because we're looking for me, we're now we're saying, me. not we're me. For me. We're looking for an inherently yeah. existent me that is separate. Because we're not the same, now we're looking for separate. Is there a separate, inherently existent me on the chair? Hmm. So I've had to change this slightly because this is what I found. Everyone's going to nothing. Uh, no, we're not looking for nothing here. We're looking for something that inherently exists. So we're starting off with who's on the seat, I am, and we're ending up with with not, not me. I we're starting not, off with me, and then we're ending right. with not me. Yep, yes, that's right. I understand that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now, so that doesn't actually tell us, like, like you're saying, Susan, so like, like, <laughs> we're saying, so what's on the seat? We really should be, so, like, so if I'm not on the seat, and I'm not inherently, that means I'm not inherently different, and I've already worked that I'm not inherently the same, like, what am I? That's this is this thing, you know. So uh, it's not really the question we ask here, it comes after. We get the shock, oh my god, I'm not there. And it's like, who am I? What am I? Which leads us to um, the king of reasonings. Well, why can't you just say, I am the person who moved to the floor? Because and you are. But you're not inherently the person who moved to the floor, are you? No, we're not inherently the person who moved to the floor. We're not the inherent person left on the seat because there's no inherent person on the floor and there's no inherent person on the seat. Eddie, it's like in this example, um, because of our habit of grasping at inherence, even if we do that thought experiment of throwing ourselves off the chair, our grasping at inherence follows us everywhere we go. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. And that's that's the thing with, you know, um, as you say, so it's a rise in independence upon all these conventionalities. You know, everything that's appearing to our senses, in other words. Right? And then our language um, supports this reification. Well, we do always speak in terms of nouns. If, if things are frozen, these ideas and language. So the idea and the language seem to be one and the same thing. Then what the idea and the language imputed towards the other objects, like self, chairs, anything, now they're reified. Now they take on the appearance of inherent existence. So we have found, right, so in terms of these ref refutations, right, so we've just refuted true existence, independent existence. All, all of these have been refuted. With what? With dependent. 
I exist dependent on the body and mind, but I am not the body or the mind, nor am I some entity separate from them. <clears throat> what is that thing? What's the deepest dependence that you can sort of work out? And that's what we've got to try and do. Now, so dependent refutes this side, an independent, inherent, true, own character, own side, and arising refutes nothing at all. Because there's something there. There's us. You know what we could say? There's nothing on the chair. I am not on the chair. Oh, so like nihilism. Yeah. The nothing right. at all. Nothing at all. Yeah. So this is like a great big huge pendulum pendulum that we go from from the true existence to the nothing exists <laughs> backwards and forwards. Yeah, bang, right. bang, bang. Yeah. And they call those the two extremes. That's right. right. From absolutely nothing to inherent existence. So, um, when it comes to, to um, what can I say? Uh, this, this dependence, right? So, what you find, having no, uh, no, true existence with any type of object, so we're not truly existing same, we're not truly existing different. We exist then in mere name. Now think about think about your identity. Like I. Like, like, what, like, what is that? So, if, so if anybody says uh, Alicia, you can put your hand up. Is is then your name is basically just a label that's put onto this combination of parts of mind and body. Yep, that's right. Yep, it's just a name called I. Mm. The name I is just put on to the body and mind, which are in constant change, flux all the time, and also lacks any findability, any true existence. Mm. So I is just the name. Now, if if what's good here is that if you think the I is more than that, that's the object to be refuted. Uh, like Lama's opposite, you know, it's like it's nearly like it doesn't exist at all. <laughs> but this is the thing: if you find, if you do this analysis and find, wow, I'm not, I'm not truly existing one and the same, and I'm not truly completely different. Uh, So like then, I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not something completely separate from them. So, and you know, like I, I exist dependently. So then, like, um, almost like psychologically, then something in me goes, So, what am I? What am I? And there's this urge to grasp at what am I? That's right. What, what happens, you have the urge and, and the natural thing to go, the I is more than just the name. It's more than just the label. So when we do that, then we know, ah, oh, there's the object. That's the object to be negated. I've got to actually find that. I need to find that first of all, before you do all this analysis. Yeah. An I that is more than just the name, more than just the label. And so, like I said, that's when you try and like spook yourself, right? So the eye seems to be much more than a, than a name or a label. Or you try and, you know, imagine that perhaps that you won the lotto and you're jumping up and then you're so happy. So these extremes behaviors. So you go, oh, there I am. That's how I, I'm appearing to me now. Then we can challenge the appearance. Yeah. It looks true, but is it true? Okay, so um, so we, so we do this type of uh, exercise that we just did, and there's plenty of others too. So we try and find as many as we can that will resonate with us and have some impact on us. So we can actually see conceptually our own emptiness. Because that's you know, like when you look at the chair and expect it, you know that I should be there if I was intrinsically, if I was inherently existent, and I'm not. I'm not there. 
So I know I do not have an intrinsic nature. I'm not intrinsically uh, established. All that's appearing there is like a vacuity, like you said, Susan, like nothing. But it's not nothing. <laughs> it's the absence of a truly existent person. That's what you're saying. So please try restrain yourself with your language. There isn't anything appearing, but what we're really looking for something, the thing we're looking to appear is an inherently existent other. It's not there. So that's what we do on these two ordinary paths. We sort of get a conceptual understanding of it and get it correct. And then we meditate on it as much as possible, becoming really familiar with it and all the reasons that go along with it. And what we're trying to do is like to stabilize this, this realization of, of the empty, the non-appearance of the object of negation. We try and rest in that. Now, now you'll see that when you did this, what often seems is like there's a me looking at my imagined chair or real chair and like, like of course, there's nothing there. I'm, I'm not there. Right? But there's always like this like, me and it. Right? So me is like the subject of awareness. And it is the objects of our awareness. So I've got subject and object and they too appearing. Um, to be different from one another, not separate from one another. Now, when that sense of separateness uh, dissolves or seen through, so that this the person analyzing, the awareness analyzing, and the object that is empty appear to be one and the same thing, now we've got the path of seeing. At that time, only emptiness is appearing. There's no idea of a me um, experiencing it or anything like that. There is just the, the, the empty. And that brings us into this path of seeing. And, and, Shari, and here, um, Avalokiteshvara says to Shariputra, Shariputra, in the same way that, you know, the form aggregate um, was seen to be empty, form was empty. You saw that. All phenomena are like this. They have no inherent characteristics. They're not inherently produced, so it says unproduced. They never just stop of their own will, so they lack an inherent ability to cease. They are stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. So this means that phenomena have no inherently existing defining characteristics. It's not saying that all phenomena don't exist at all. The phenomena exist. They lack inherent characteristics. So the phenomena do exist as only inherent existence that does not exist. So this path of seeing becomes the first of the 10 spiritual grounds of the bodhisattvas. And at last, it's very, very short, this, this period. You sort of like, I will get it, and you'll be in, in it for a little while, and then it'll finish, but you've seen it. Now you know. And this path of seeing is defined as a realization of a bodhisattva who sees emptiness directly. There's a method for attaining the Mahayana path of meditation. So in other words, what it's saying, so once we see emptiness directly, we need to, to um, become more familiar with, we need to become, we need to familiarize ourselves with seeing it, right? to seeing the empty. And, and that familiarization process is all the path of meditation. And this path of seeing, I said, just got these, um, two major paths. It's called the pristine wisdom of meditative equipoise and pristine wisdom of subsequent attainment. What these are basically getting at, I just say basically because this, you can really unpack this, it's quite large. Um, so you find yourself experiencing this pristine wisdom. I mean, you're having the subjective awareness experience of emptiness. And then it stops. 
but you come out of your meditation session. Now you're, you know, like, like us sitting in front of cameras and things and talking to one another. But what you've understood um, has an impact on what we're doing now. It's called you know, the other subsequent attainment. Things are not as solid as we first thought they were. In fact, if you look at the text, it says, look at all things to be like illusions, like reflections in water, like echoes. You know, you have all these different similes. And so that's what we, we try to familiarize our minds with, because it's a bit strange when you have a look for something, it's inherent existence, the whole thing vanishes. Uh, and it's just emptiness. And then you come out of that, oh, everything is here, but emptiness is not. <laughs> just like, I've got to remind ourselves. Um, so, you, Eddie, do the bodhisattvas find that a bit jarring? Like, do they get a shock when they come back out of their equipoise? <laughs> um, I think it probably more, it depends. It depends. For some people, it's quite shocking. Um, but for others, it's very funny. Yeah. Now, this um, that quote when he talked about um, what did you say? Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, and so forth. These are called the eight empty aspects, and we have these first two. So he says, all phenomena are emptiness. So this is talking about the deepest nature of any conventionally existent phenomena. As its ultimate nature is to be empty. And it's also these, these, all these phenomena have no characteristics that inherent, inherently exist. And th these two characteristics are, are referred to as the door of emptiness. And they're really talking about the phenomena themselves. Now, the next four characteristics, to be unproduced, unceased, stainless, and not without stain, these phenomena too, are like, like I said, all phenomena are empty. But here what we've singled out here is um, the causes of phenomena. So all causes lack inherent existence. All causes are empty of inherent existence. And so they use these four terms here to you know, say that this is the case. And the last two, oh, sorry, and these four here that you know, have to do with, um, with the causes are called the door of signlessness. So have the, often they call it the three doors of emptiness. So the first two is just the nature, the, the door of emptiness. That's it. The door of signlessness is referring, is saying to us that all causes are without any inherent existence. And these last two are the door of wishlessness. In other words, of every result that you seek, any effects that are experienced are without any inherent existence. So here we're talking about not deficient, not fulfilled. It's basically just saying that you know the the particular things that we want to get rid of, you know, like for instance, our hatred, our self-grasping, these phenomena that we wish to be rid of, which we wish to decrease, do not inherently decrease. That their decrease is dependent upon the work that we put into it. And the good qualities that we seek more love, more compassion, more acceptance, Buddhahood itself, that none of these qualities inherently increase. They require effort too. They will dependently increase, but they will not inherently increase. And same for the negative side, they, those neg negativities will dependently decrease or decrease dependently upon our skill and effort we put into it, it will come about, but they will never decrease inherently. An inherent decrease will never take place. So it's a bit like seeing how we sort of like wish to win the lotto. And you might say, well, uh, have you bought a ticket? And you might say, well, no. So, so 
yeah, it's never going to happen, is it? <laughs> so we need to, you know, buy a ticket. So then the uh, chances of actually winning increase. They have increased dependently upon us doing something, buying a ticket. So these are the eight, eight in the aspects. You say the nature, the causes, the effects. So Eddie, this this um clears up a, a minor mystery for me. Whenever in the prayers where you hear the the three doors of um, signlessness, uh, what is it? The the three People, something emptiness, and signless. emptiness, signless, and I and I always misread it as emptiness, singlessness. <laughs> Because yeah. I don't know dyslexia and then wishlessness, and I I've always wondered what on earth are these yeah. three things. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> so he says that right, and then so now this is like I said before, this is the sort of um the big presentation for those of um, small intelligence like us, right? You can see it's sort of expanding, can't you? With that first verse, he starts, you know, Shariputra. The, the very brief was, was just before form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is other than form, blah, blah, blah. But that's sort of now going, that's left on the path of accumulation. Now we've got the path of seeing and meditation. Um, we move now to the path of meditation. So, so he continues on talking to Shariputra, saying, uh, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on, up to including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. So I think a simple way of talking about this is that when you are in meditative equipoise on emptiness, right? So you've actually, you had a similar type of experience where you go, my God, this is, I'm not there. I'm not on the seat. Right? So it's like looking for the inherent existence of the form and then you go, oh my God, it's not there. Right? So you're always getting a not there. It's always, there. there's nothing else there. It's just not there. And you're familiarizing yourself with that you're resting in the absence. So remember, it's not just like, like um, nothing is there. There's a mind that understands this absence. It's your mind. Yeah. So Eddie, is it's like our mind that's going through all of these things um, that we normally think of as like solid and inherent and going through the list and going yep. uh nope 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 nope, nope. Right. <laughs> yeah yeah that's right yep that's right and, and when we say when when the nope is there it's like the objects out there just like we weren't on the seat right we weren't on the seat form is not there feeling is not there right? no I, it's not saying they don't exist it's that they don't exist when you look to see if they inherently exist their absence appears, and that absence is is the empty we, we try to get at. So here we can see the five aggregates are empty, the six sense powers, the 12 sources, and the 18 constituents. So four major groups, um, particularly to do with the, with the person, the five aggregates, six senses, 12 sources, and the 18 constituents are all empty of inherent existence. And so this path of meditation is like it's a realization of a superior bodhisattva who is either abandoning or who has abandoned innate true grasping by practicing meditation. Now, Lama Songkhapa is, is quite a, is, and the Galupa way of doing this is quite different from the way the other traditions do it. So Lama Songkhapa's presentation, he, he takes all the objects, all the objects of knowledge, 
and subjects them to this wisdom, that this intelligence of ours. And we're going to see, my God, none of them has true existence. None of them exist truly. None of them exist inherently. And upon that understanding, that realization, what it, what it does is stops us believing that they inherently exist. Right? So stop. It, it's sort of like an indirect way of getting at the mind. It says, oh, you, you think things inherently exist? Let's have a look. We look at the objects, they don't. Once you see that, you can't keep, you know, <laughs> going into the falsity and think, yeah, they do, they do, they do. Yeah, like you've seen, they don't. <coughs> so he's either a band, this, you know, and through that process, you actually see the absence. And so when that happens, you, you are in the process of abandoning or have abandoned, dependent upon the time you spend in that, in that realization. So there's a, a nice uh, metaphor or simile that you can use for this. So you could say, you know, a, a realization of a superior body sat there, you go, well, okay, there's a smart person and he's stopping the belief or he no longer has the belief about something. So if you look at yourself and go, <clears throat> like, like for me, I had a bit of a, um, a funny up, upbringing in, in life. So I remember this time like, living with these bunch of guys and they were all addicts of some one type or another. And um, one of them was a gambling addict. Uh, and I liked all these guys and thought, you know, like they were my friends. And I let them live in my house. And some they had no money, right? They're all messed up. You know, they're living in my house and I realized things are disappearing from my house. Uh, my goods are actually being stolen by some of the people here, one or two of the people here. And they're selling it and they're getting money and they're gambling it or spending it on drugs or alcohol or whatever, you know, but that's what's going on. <clears throat> so I, when I realized this, I had to abandon the idea that these people were actually my good friends. <laughs> <All right? laughs> that these people should keep living in my house, that they're good, they're okay. Yeah. Because I see the, the, the behavior. So I had to drop this idea and go, actually, I need to tell all these guys to leave. They need to find a place of their own. And so, so I don't believe it, this anymore because I've, I've, I've seen what they're doing. I acknowledge it. Now it's the same here. When we see that the phenomena don't have the inherent existence, we, we stop believing that they do. We've always believed they did, but we see now they don't. So we stop believing it. Like when I believed the people I was looking after were my friends. Uh, but then they behave in an unfriendly way. <laughs> well, obviously, they're not my friends. Uh, Just stop the share for a sec, Hans, so we can see your... What do you about? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So we have this path yeah. of meditation. And it, it also has these two parts, pristine wisdoms of meditative equipoise and pristine wisdoms of subsequent attainment. In the subsequent attainment periods, this is when you're really working on the six perfections. So you, you are ethical, you are generous, you are patient, and your patience and your generosity and ethics are mixed in with your understanding mm -hmm. that these three new ways of behaving lack inherent existence and dependently exist. And the goal you're achieved, aiming for, Buddhahood, has no true existence, but does exist in mere name. And what we're doing is a dependent arising. So therefore, it lacks inherent existence. So, so we're bringing in all the time our understanding. They call it the mixing of the three spheres, um, object, subject, and action. And so the verse sort of follows on, you know, where um, Avalokiteshvara continues to the Venerable Shariputra. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, 
no attainment and also no um, non-attainment. So here we're looking at another group of phenomena, again, having a great impact on us. We've got the 12 links on the afflicted side and we've got the 12 links on the pure side. So that's in this first section. Where it comes, there is no suffering origination. We're saying the four noble truths of the Aryas do not inherently exist. And when I examine them, when I'm in meditative equipoise on emptiness, they do not appear. If they did appear, we would know they inherently existed. Just as if we were still sitting on the chair, we'd know, okay, I do inherently exist. So, Eddie, is this like taking basically the entire Buddhist canon and saying none of it exists inherently, That's just right. to, to look at everything that we've been trying to learn and then reminding ourselves? And the main point is nothing of it exists inherently. Well, that's half of the main point. The, 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 you, we've got to conjoin this. It's good to know, yeah, it doesn't in, exist inherently and does exist dependently. It does exist dependently. It's a very fine balance that, like, it's almost like trying to walk a tightrope, isn't it, without tipping over to one side or the other? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so I'll put up this last slide, um, and it's sort of like a summary of the objects on the path of meditation. Um, and then we can open it up for a little bit of uh, discussion, if you like. So here we began with the five aggregates, six sense powers in the 12 sources and the 18 constituents. So I found that like this is you can sort of memorize this by just going, okay, that, that's on one side, right? Five, six, 12, and eight. <laughs> and it's really about you know our bodies, speech and mind, isn't it? Five aggregates like body and mind, six sense powers, well, that's again body and mind, 12 sources, body and mind. And then the 18 constituents, everything else you see and engage with. Then we have the 12 links on the afflicted side, the 12 links on the pure side. Describing how we get into cyclic existence, it has no inherent existence, it's dependent. And how we get out also is dependent, therefore it lacks inherent existence. The Four Noble Truths. Um, dependently exist and lacking inherent existence, they exist in mere name. And finally, the qualities, the abandonments, the emptinesses of any Arya being um, also lack inherent existence. So this is sort of getting at the idea that emptiness itself is empty of inherent existence. Yeah? The ultimate truth doesn't ultimately exist. And if you say, like, like, why, why is there um, um, is, why is isn't that, the, yeah. Is that because you need to have a being to be experiencing the ultimate truth? So it depends on it being experienced? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So the most you know, subtle one, of course, like I said, <clears throat> and the one, once you come down to it, <clears throat> and get it, it'll be your go-to point. And uh, like I said, one of the simplest ways I've found to like go to it is just put this, just try to imagine if consciousness did not exist at all. So you, you'd have no perception, you couldn't perceive anything with your senses, and you couldn't actually think of anything. You couldn't have any ideas. So you have no conceptual consciousnesses, you have no perceptual consciousnesses. So consciousnesses don't exist. You could imagine something like that. What could you know about the world? 
Anybody? <laughs> well, well, you couldn't know anything. No, you couldn't know anything. You, you wouldn't that's even right. know if there was a world. <laughs> that's right. You, that's dead right. You couldn't. There's no way of, of knowing. So the mind is a knower. That's its function. It knows. So if you pull it out, then there's no knowledge of anything. So that goes, okay. So the, the, not, the knowledge of anything depends upon a mind. As soon as you've got dependent, you have to rule out intrinsic. Everything that goes against dependent is ruled out. Independent, intrinsic, from its own side, by its own nature, naturally, all is it? No. Because they depend upon the mind. Now, one of the things you'll know with your mind, especially perception, right? So an object appears to perception. If you ask yourself, like, what is it? Perception can't answer. Your perception cannot say, that's called a sunset, Eddie. So what, what's doing the same? It's the conceptual mind. The conceptual mind is naming those phenomena. Mm -hmm. So now we have a phenomenon that's dependent upon the name to be known. Yeah, so that's um, something that's really prevalent when you hear stories of people who um, have had no, no visual sight and then have an operation later on in life and get their sight back so they can see yeah. all the things that we can see and they have no idea what any of it is because there's no mind being able to recognise them. It's just a visual right appearance with no meaning that's right yep so yeah so conception plays its part and if you ask like so how does that do that well it, it imputes the names it gives the names and and i mean even with that example with the site the most important thing was actually the the imputation the names not the site because um the people that got their site for the first time ever in later life actually became suicidal because now they couldn't kind of anchor themselves in any form of experience because the sight dominated them and it had no meaning. Whereas when they were blind, at least they could touch things and they knew what they were and where they were and everything associated. Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of, you know, I sort of try and draw it up, up like that and you can sort of go oh my god without the names those things aren't the things that are named without perception or in conception you can't even get at anything so there's there's dependent right. and like i said if you have dependent dependent goes against independent you know so and it's quite interesting like you know when you're saying sometimes people get really freaked out but sometimes you sort of laugh um, at your discovery. You know, so it is quite, I've found it, it's quite funny to, you know, like look at something and then no name appearing, you know, and then you give it the name. And now it exists for you. Now you have an experience of that thing. Yes, Barbara. So, Eddie, things are labeled. Yep. Simply so that we can communicate. Yep, that's right. Yeah. So if I say, Eddie, would you please bring me a glass? You don't bring me a scissors. Yep. So it, so that we know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's why all the labels. Yeah, that's right. That's why all the labels. It's really helpful. But then there's another part with the, with the funny thing here. So, yeah, so it's like I said, we're imputing. The mind imputes, conceptual mind imputes the labels. Now, this is the only other meaning of imputation, right? So that, that's the general meaning. I think it's quite easy to understand. Like you say, um, just, just um, giving the names, Barbara, right? so, so we can function. Right? Now, think about this and subject it to analysis or, or your own experience, try it. After you've named the object, how does the object appear back to you? It 
it, doesn't it appear to appear back to us as what we've named it? Yeah, then it seems like there it is over there. There it is over there. This, this happened to me, Eddie, when I was um, in a fruit market and I was looking at these fruits and I had no idea what they were and I, um, so, you know, what is it, what is it? Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't even grasp what it was except because I, as far as I got was labelling it as a fruit. And then when it was given the name, then it was like, oh, that's what it is, and now suddenly it was there. But that's until right. then was this uncomfortable feeling of what is it and wanting to know, wanting to put the label on so I could grasp it intellectually, I suppose, yeah, or conceptually. Real. Yeah, yeah, you want something real. <laughs> yeah. And happens. then you know the name and then you go, oh, well, you oh, know, that's, that's a persimmon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. There it is over there, as if the persimmon now exists without me having to put a name on it. <laughs> and so that's like existing from its own side now. So, we, you know, from its, from its side, it didn't have a name. We gave it a name. And now it seems like the name and the, the basis of its name are now coming back at us. And that's it. <laughs> and we, we buy into it, believe it's true. We, the name... And the basis are one and the same the thing, same. and they're both over there. Yeah, that's right. That's how it appears. And then and then I forget about it. <laughs> yep, that's right. Yep, that's right. Alicia has her hand raised. Ah, uh, let me see. So how's that, everybody? Is it like <laughs> Ali oh. Alicia has her hand raised. Okay, Alicia. Uh, uh, I was just gonna say, um, yeah, just further to what you were just talking about, sort of like once you give something the name, like the fruit in the market, it's then almost like the name comes out of the object. It's almost yeah, like the right. object becomes that name. But that's I was right. also thinking the other day about how um, I feel like different languages are a really nice example of emptiness because we all label something differently. Like if you call something um, like a coffee cup or a glass, in English, but in a different language, it would going to have a completely different label. So that kind yeah. of is a nice way of refuting, like a glass isn't inherently a glass because if I spoke a different language, it would be called something else. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so these are great ways of coming at dependent arising. You know, if you know, if you get dependent arising, then you know, okay, then it's, then it's empty of, of an independent existence. Of not depending, and you know, so this thing of here, like I said, about the if we look at you know, we say, so what's important about this? What 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 value does this knowledge have? So just like the example Miffy gave with the fruit, you know, you, you don't know what it is. You put the name on it. Now it comes back to you, and now it's real. It's true. But that's why we have this like the true existence. The name and the thing appear to be one and the same. It's true. Now think about how we relate to one another. Uh, the names, the names we give to others. The names of the behavior that we give to others. Uh, and then, like I said, so when we do that, now it seems to be coming at us. Now it seems to be really true. But uh, uh, one of the things I hope you can see here is how we, we are creating our own sort of realities through language, through awareness itself. And then, which is fine, because that's how it all works. Right? That's, that's the conventional way that things exist. They exist dependently upon consciousness, name, and now you have objects. But, but if, if we name things and we forget that we are the ones imputing and it actually comes back at us if it were real, we could be naming, we give people names, don't we? You know, we, we call them on their behaviour. And then so the, you think about that, how that affects us. And when everything that comes at us is always appearing true, none of it appears false, it all appears true. And we, we believe it. So we act on it. And yeah, a lot of it is um, not as true so as we thought it was. That's really what 
where we get racism and prejudice and all of that from yeah, believing sure. those names that we have, we don't even know we've put the names on. No. We just think they're it. They're it. And no, that we will, we'll, we'll believe the names that other people have put on. Mm. Anyway, this is um, coming up to the, like the, um, can I say that? I wanted to sort of stop here and not and not go on to the, the, the new stuff, which we'll, we'll, we'll look at that new stuff next week. Um, so I hope that um, some of it's been useful to you. At least it, it makes you think about this. Uh, is there anything finally? Uh, and um, so, Susan, it does take time, um, and sometimes quite a bit of time. If I look at my own um, journey through this way of being, uh, um, sometimes you get the insights quite quick, but then it's really hard to articulate them. And other times you read how others have verbalized it or written it, and um, it's extremely difficult then too. But then again, other times, some of you, it's just like, oh, you, you get it, you know? It's like really clear. So what I, I just, I encourage you just to keep, keep an open mind and subject, you know, the appearances to analysis. Ask yourself, if there, what it appears to me, is it true? Or does it truly exist? you'll see there's a discrepancy between appearance and existence. So what's our takeaway? Well, we have some knowledge of the wisdom on the path of seeing. You know there's a, what you're going to see is just emptiness. <laughs> there's nothing else that appears when you engage the meditative equipoise on the path of seeing. It's only the emptiness of inherent existence or whatever the objects are. Only emptiness appears. And that there are sort of these eight objects of wisdom on the path of um, meditation. And those were, of course, the you know, five aggregates, the six sense powers, the 12 sources, the 18 constituents, 12 pure links, 12 afflicted links, four noble truths, and the um, abandonments and so forth, the realizations of the Arya beings. These all lack inherent existence. So um, what, one last, uh, just another thing that might help you. If, if you come up with different problems in your life or things you want to work out, just start by telling yourself immediately, this dependently exists. This dependently exists. Then you have a lot of freedom to move. You have a vast, you have access to all the different causes and conditions that produce it. You've got access to, them, to your own mindfulness of how your own mind is playing a part in what you, what's appearing to you. You know that the language you are using to describe your situation will produce effects. So be careful about how you use your language. Be careful how you think, because your results are dependent on that. Whatever your experiences depend on that. Miffy. Yeah, Eddie, this I find really um, helpful, especially just to think, well, how would someone else describe this very same situation that I'm going through? And so even if I just think of my best friends or what would the Dalai Lama say about it, uh, it's... Yeah already immediately a whole different scenario comes into my mind or a different way of describing it, just using words differently. So yeah. really practical. Yeah, and like I said, yeah, just think about the usage of words, how until you use the names, you don't, there's, you know, I mean, there's something appearing, but there's nothing really knowing more about it. And so, like I said, be, be careful how you use words. So we've come to the end. <laughs> um, I hope it was enjoyable. I hope you found something useful about it and something you know you can use.
So I want to dedicate um, uh, our merits, the merit that we're putting into trying to understand uh, the nature of reality. And may this understanding um, be shared with others, uh, impact others in very useful ways so that they can actually find paths to authentic happiness and find ways of abandoning whatever causes suffering. So next week we'll look at these qualities and we'll look at no more learning in the mantra, but right now we'll dedicate. So due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Jewel, Bodhicitta, not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline but increase forevermore. And as long as space endures and as long as sentient beings abide, may I to remain to the skull sorrows of the world. So we've come to the end. Thank you, Kodo, Shayla, Alicia, Susan. Thank you very much. And Barbara. And for all those who I cannot see or do not know are here, um, live well, look after yourselves, be good, and stay alive. Do the best you can. Okay, we'll see you again later. Thank Bye -bye. you, Eddie.